thy cries to the heart. survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but lost and Content on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet. So.
Good morning, Redeeming Life Church. Good morning. I'm Pastor Brian. It's so good to see all of you here. You obviously were able to work out the time change and everything else, and here you are. So welcome. I want to take just a moment to welcome some guests who are with us from Nebraska. They're with CSF. They're here to do some mission work with us. That is the Christian Student Fellowship, right? And they're all from... Yay! The University of Nebraska Kearney. Did I get that right? And they are here to help us in this mission field. So we are so grateful to have them. I'm happy to see some other guests that are here. I have a few quick announcements before we turn our attention to praising our Lord. First, we have mission training, which our mission team is going to be joining us. But we want to invite all of the church to come back at 2 o'clock from 2 to 5, and I'm going to be leading us in some very helpful mission tools to help you do the work that we are called to do to to spread the gospel all throughout our community where we live, work, play, where we do business with our neighbors and all that. So come and join me. It's a lot of fun. It's a workshop. It's some hands-on stuff. I think it'll be really beneficial if you come. Next, we have our senior adult luncheon tomorrow at 1130. And we want to encourage that you come. If you're a senior or if you know a senior or if you'd like to meet some seniors, this would be a great time to come. So we need to know that you're coming, though. So either RSVP on Realm or there is a sign-up in the lobby. That way we know how much food to make so we don't run short. Because when we run short, the seniors that can't make it because they're shut-ins don't end up getting a lunch. Sometimes we'll pack a lunch and take it to them. So we just need to know how many we have. Sign up, come, and be a part of it. And then finally, if you have been with us for a little bit of time, maybe you've come to a pizza with the pastors, maybe you've just been here for long enough to know, I have got to be a part of this church family as a covenant member. I've got to to be all in. We are having a new members class. It's a two-part that starts on the 17th, right after church, So we would love to have you come. If you have questions, you can come talk with me about it. There's a sign-up out in the lobby. We would love to just answer questions for you. Coming to the class doesn't mean you automatically are becoming a member. So no commitment, but it's a good way to learn and grow and and ask questions. All right. With all of that out of the way, let's turn our attention to worshiping the Lord. I'd like to read Psalm 150, verses 1 through 6. God's Word says, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant graceness. His abundant greatness. Praise him with trumpet blast. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with the tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you. Lord, may we praise you with our voices this morning. May we praise you with our attention. May we praise you with our hearts and our affection, with our thoughts, with everything that we are, Lord. We thank you that you give us breath to sing back praises to you. So, Lord, this morning, as we give you our attention, as we press aside all of the distractions and the and the things that might divert our praise. Lord, may you fill us so that everything can be given to you for this next hour, Lord, hopefully more. May we be people who hear attentively from your word. May we be people who fellowship greatly in love because you first loved us. And Lord, may we sing praises like the trumpet blast, the harp, the lyre, the crashing cymbals, Lord. May we give you all glory and praise. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. But we have a chorus that we're going to add to this. I'm going to sing it for you really quick. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God who saved. that let's sing praise God from whom all blessings flow praise God 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Let earth, let earth and heaven be saints proclaim the power and might of his great name. Let us exalt on bended knee. Praise God the Holy Trinity. the king praise to the king his throne transcends his crown and kingdom never end now and throughout eternity I'll praise the one who died for From whom all blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. Lift your eyes to heaven, see the Holy One eternal. Behold the Lord of majesty exalted in his temple. Oh, lift your eyes to heaven, see the Holy One eternal. Behold the Lord of majesty exalted in his temple. As symphonies of angels praise. Come worship, fall before His grace, the King in all His beauty. Singing, how worthy? How worthy, how worthy, how worthy, the King in all His beauty. Now see the 
the king who wears a crown, one made of shame and splinters, the sacrifice for ruined men, the substitute for sinners. As earth is stained with royal blood and quakes with love and fury, he breathes his last and bows his head, the King in all his beauty. Singing, how worthy, how worthy, how worthy, how worthy, the King in all his beauty. Lifted up. Now see the Savior lifted up, the Lamb who reigns in splendor, the hope of every tribe and tongue, His kingdom is forever. Bring praise and honor to His courts, bring wisdom, power, blessing. For in the sages will adore the King in all his beauty. How worthy, how worthy, how worthy the King in all his beauty. How worthy.
passion you were buried the word of life was silenced by the grave but towards the death cannot contain your glory our God rolled a stone wonderful and we seek to declare that fervently with our lives with our words Lord with our passions with our heart God bless us as we continue in worship this morning and Lord move in us that we would see your beauty in this this morning it's in Jesus name amen you guys may be seated we're going to continue in our worship by collecting our tithes and offerings. And here at Redeeming Life, this is an act that we do as an act of worship. So if you're a guest with us, don't feel like you have to participate in this, but know that you can, and you're more than welcome to if you'd like. But we're going to collect an offering to help further the work that God has called us in mission and in service and in glorifying Him. So if I could have our ushers come forward. Uh, there they are. If we could have our ushers come forward. I'd like to pray for our offering this morning. If you'd like to give uh, by some other way besides the, the offering we're collecting, you can do that with the various means that are up on the screen. Uh, there's all sorts of information up there. If you'd like to do that electronically, we are so grateful for your faithful giving. We're especially grateful for your faithful heart and your sacrificial heart in that. Let's pray for our offering. Lord, this morning, we ask that you would first give us a generous heart, but Lord, second, give us a heart that stewards your resources well for your glory. So Lord, as we collect this offering and as we use this offering, help us to steward every single penny. And Lord, use every single penny to further your kingdom in this place and around the world to make your son known and to glorify you. Lord, I am so thankful that you provide for the work of your harvest. And so Lord, we, we worship you now by giving back our first fruits in that. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as they're passing that, I want to talk to the kiddos, but also I want to talk to the adults, because there is a mission team here, and I don't know how many of you have been on a, on a mission trip, but mission work is hard, and so they're just getting here, and I'm guessing by now they've already had some kind of fiasco or some kind of trouble. I think you guys drove here, right? They drove here, which is how many hours? 11 hours, probably in a van. All in one or two vans, right? Two vans. They probably ate road snacks. Road snacks do things. <laughs> then they, they don't know if they can make it. They don't know if they can. How many more hours are we there yet? Oh, only ten and a half more hours. I'm never going to make it. Mission work is hard. And they got here and there was probably some fiasco with where they were going to sleep and how the bedding was going to work and this problem and that problem. And then they couldn't figure out how to make the shower work right. And, and all this stuff. Because that's what happens when we do mission work. Mission work is hard. But here's the thing. I'm amazed they even came. I'm amazed they came. Here's why. Because when you look at the big picture of mission work, it's not really a good sales pitch. So kiddos, I don't know if you've ever seen this. I, I had these videos when my kids were little. They were by the Voice of the Martyrs. They're called the Torchlighter series. Anybody ever seen those? I think they're... You can find them. They're great. They tell by way of old-timey cartoon style, meaning like the actual animated drawn, like what older people grew up with, not computer-drawn graphics. as old-timey cartoon style telling the story of missionaries and some pretty big missionaries. 
And my kids loved these stories, and, and I would watch them with them. And then at one point, I asked myself, is this a good idea that I'm having my kids watch these cartoons? Because some of the missionaries get killed. Like, it's bad. They die. Some of the missionaries go through tremendous hardship. And they had life that was so easy and so good. They're maybe Olympians or something. And then they go to China, and then there's a war, and they end up in China, and it's hard, and they can't leave. Or others that are helping with orphans, and it just seems impossible, and they're never going to make it. And how is this ever going to work? Or all kinds of other really hard, super impossible things. People getting sick, and families dying, and they're not having enough money, and, and all sorts of things. There was one missionary who never asked anybody for help, but he prayed. And he prayed, and he prayed, and God always provided, but it seemed like he never had what he needed till the very last second. That would be hard. That's a lot harder than riding for ten and a half hours in a van full of young men and women eating road snacks. It's hard work. So why would we do it? How did they do it? How did they even get here? Well, here's what we're going to hear Pastor Josiah tell us from the book of Acts this morning. He's going to open up God's Word, and we're going to discover that in God's Word, God tells us that He sustains the missionaries. Do you know what sustain means? That's a big word. That's a big word. Sustain means like he keeps it going. He holds it up. He gives it everything it needs so that it can happen. Did you know that if God didn't sustain the missionaries, they'd never succeed? It wouldn't work. We'd never see missionaries going around the world. And if we never saw missionaries going around the world or even coming here, God's word wouldn't be proclaimed around the world. But God wants his word proclaimed around the world. Therefore, he sustains his missionaries, so that they're able to go through and do some of the most crazy, impossible things, all to glorify God. Now, I hope that our mission team that's here this week doesn't have to go through too difficult of things, but I know that even if they do, God will sustain them. So we're going to pray for these missionaries, but I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to hear Pastor Josiah open God's Word and tell us about how God sustains the work of his mission. Lord, I am so thankful I'm thankful for the little kiddos in here that you might call somewhere around the world. I ask that you do, that they would go and do hard, hard things in hard, hard places, knowing that you sustain them, and hanging on to you tightly. Lord, I want to pray for the mission team that is here in Utah from Nebraska that's here to do the work that you've called them to do. Sustain them, please. And Lord, for those of us who live here in this place, sustain us. Carry us through. Continue that your mission would continue. We need you to fill us that we could continue going because apart from you, we can do nothing. So I thank you that you sustain your work. And Lord, I plead with you that you would sustain us more and more and more so that the work could go further and further and further. As Josiah comes to open your word, let us be attentive. Speak to us in terms that we can each understand. And Lord, move and stir in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian, and thank you, mission team, for joining us and helping us here on the mission in Utah. Well, as Pastor Brian mentioned, we're continuing our series going through the book of Acts this morning, so I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 18 as we continue to see when the gospel goes. If you're using one of those church Bibles, little red Bibles near around you, we're going to be on page 985. And then, as always, everything's in the Version Bible app as well. You can just go to more and click on today's event, and you can find all the scriptures in there as well. Today we're going to see Paul arrive in Corinth as we look at the first 17 verses here of chapter 18. Acts 18, starting in the first verse, says, After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. 
From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians were, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. The Lord said to Paul in the night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. While Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, See to it yourselves. I refuse to be judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Flosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. This is God's word. Will you please bow your heads with me as we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that we have this opportunity to gather together, Lord, to open your word and hear from you this morning. Lord, as as we prepare to dive in here and and look at Paul's uh, missionary journey here in Corinth, Lord, I pray that you would open our minds and ears to hear your voice. Speak to us today, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. May we leave here changed by the power of the gospel, Lord, and by your word. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, church, I have a confession to make. I am what the experts call an amateur golfer. Emphasis on amateur. <laughs> I, I love golf, but I'm kind of an amateur at it. I'm new at it. Actually, I had the opportunity to go to Top Golf this week. Anybody ever been to Top Golf? I love Top Golf. I went there this week with my dad, and a lot of people love Top Golf because you can play Angry Birds. They have an Angry Birds game there. Kids love that. I love it because you can eat while you golf. <laughs> like anytime I can combine food and an activity, I'm there. So, I'm sitting there, I'm eating cheese fries, tater tots, all the good stuff, and you can even play a virtual course. So my dad and I, we were at Spyglass Hill in California, here in Utah, and we're playing this virtual course. And it was amazing to me, because no matter which club I used, or how hard I swung it, or whatever I did, each hole, I was faithful to get a double bogey. And if you've never played golf, you're saying, double bogey? Pastor Joe, that sounds amazing. It is amazing. It's twice as many bogeys as one bogey. But if you're playing golf, you're saying, we're never golfing with that man ever, and I wouldn't blame you. But I was faithful every time to get the same result. And just as I was faithful in golf, we see that Paul is faithful in ministry. Paul was faithful in ministry. Throughout our study in Acts, we've seen multiple instances where Paul has shown faithfulness to do what the Lord commanded him to do. Now granted, his little dispute with Barnabas was not a highlight moment in his ministry, However, the fact remains that we've seen Paul's faithfulness on display time and time again. So in our text this morning, we find yet another example of Paul's faithfulness to follow Christ and live out the Lord's calling on his life. In fact, there were five instances or five examples in our text this morning that I saw where Paul was faithful to obey Christ. So what I'd like us to do during our time together this morning is really review these five instances together and see Paul's faithfulness here in Corinth. Maybe we too can find out how we can be faithful and trust the Lord and obey him based on the example that we see from Paul's own life and his ministry. So for those note takers in the room, the first thing I want us to see is that Paul was faithful to do the work. Paul was faithful to do the work. If we look again at the first four verses, we see that. It says, after this, he left Athens and he went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both the Jews and the Greeks. Paul was faithful to do whatever it took to continue proclaiming the gospel, including working a vocational job. 
Paul had been a tent maker in the past, so when he found them, he continued working in tent making with them. In these opening verses of verse 18, we see Paul arriving in Corinth, after which he quickly finds this couple, Priscilla and Aquila. They're living in Corinth because Claudius expelled all the Jews living in Rome due to a major conflict, which Bible scholars believe centered around Jesus Christ and whether or not he was the Messiah. So in order to keep the peace, Claudius kicks all the Jews out of Rome so that he doesn't have to listen to everyone argue anymore. As a result, Aquila and his wife Priscilla have moved to Corinth. And they've opened up the first A&P store in town. That's a grocery store joke for the two of you that got it. <laughs> if you read your Bible before, if you've read your Bible, then you're probably familiar with these two faithful things. Now, we don't know whether Priscilla and Aquila were Christians before they were exiled from Rome, or whether they became Christians as a result of Paul's faithful witness here in Corinth. We don't know for sure. Luke is silent on this issue. But what we do know, though, is that at some point these two do become Christians, because we're going to read more about them and how they continued to assist Paul in ministry later on in our study here through Acts. Maybe even today you find yourself in a similar situation to Paul. Sure, none of us in this room are probably working as tent makers, but regardless of what your nine-to-five job is, each one of us has been called to share the gospel with those around us. Earlier this week, I heard a story about Philip Armour. Philip Armour. Philip Armour was the founder of the Armour meatpacking industry in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This is back in the day when you could own a monopoly. And because of his successful meatpacking business, Mr. Armour not only owned a monopoly, but he basically ran Chicago. So one day, Mr. Armour's traveling. He's traveling on a train, and he's sitting beside a young businessman. And this young businessman is in his 20s. He has no idea who he's sitting next to. So the two of them just kind of strike up a conversation, and as they're talking, this young businessman asks Mr. Armour what he did for a living. What do you think his response was? Mr. Armour's response was amazing. Mr. Armour turned to the young businessman and said, my job is to tell people about Jesus Christ. I just pack a little beat on the side. <laughs> Church, our careers should not define who we are. The work that we do in order to pay our bills or keep a roof over our head should serve as a secondary purpose to our primary mission of telling others about Jesus Christ. As Christians, each one of us is an ambassador of Christ, and we have been commissioned by the King to proclaim the saving message of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. It doesn't matter if you're an accountant, if you work in IT, or your job stocking grocery store shelves, or sorting nuts and bolts, or if you're a Hollywood movie star. Our primary task is to proclaim the gospel. Even when he was making tents during the week to put food on the table, Paul's primary task was sharing the gospel. In fact, that's the next thing I want us to see from our text this morning. The second thing Paul did was he was faithful to preach the word. Look again at verses 4 through 8. Verses 4 through 8, it says, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews, that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes, and he told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Justice, a worshiper of God whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. And catch this, many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. Paul was faithful to preach. Even when he gets run out of the synagogue, he continues preaching. Paul was faithful to proclaim the gospel. Paul committed himself to preaching the word of God. From the very beginning, we see Paul proclaiming the gospel message of Jesus in the synagogue every Sabbath. Week in and week out, Paul can always be found at the synagogue on Saturday. He works hard making tents throughout the week so that he can eat, so he can have a roof over his head. But then when the weekend comes, he spends his day off proclaiming the gospel and reasoning with the Jews. Then, as soon as Timothy and Silas show up, Paul's able to shift some things around and spend even more time preaching the gospel. According to Bible scholars, it's very likely that when Paul's missionary companions arrived in Corinth, they brought with them some financial aid to help support Paul in his missionary efforts here in Corinth. Either that or maybe Timothy and Silas found jobs as well and so it freed Paul up to spend less time making tents and more time preaching the gospel. Whatever the case may be, Luke tells us that Paul was committed to preaching the gospel 
And as a result, lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. Despite the fact that many of the Jews started blaspheming against God and resisting the gospel, Luke tells us here in verse 8 that a very prominent, very important Jewish leader hears the gospel, believes in Christ, and is saved. How incredible is that? <coughs> Excuse me. Based on what we see happening here in the life of Crispus, we too should be praying for non-believing leaders and rulers. Based on what we see here in Acts, we should be praying for the salvation of religious leaders around the world. If God can do it then, God can still do it today. The fact that the ruler of the synagogue was converted just adds more weight to the incredible truth that the gospel is powerful enough to transform the lives of anyone and everyone. By the world's standards, Crispus had nothing to gain and everything to lose by rejecting Judaism and following Christ. And yet that's exactly what he did. And Crispus wasn't the first religious leader that we see the Lord save here in the book of Acts. If you were to go back and read the beginning of Acts, you'd see how in one moment Paul was the greatest threat to Christianity. And in the next, he was the biggest advocate for the gospel. The gospel changes us. It changes lives. It transformed Paul's life, and it changed Christmas' life as well. And it changes our lives too. So what was this gospel message? What was the gospel message that Paul was preaching? What did Paul say that caused Crispus and his entire household, along with many other Corinthians, to believe in the Lord and be baptized? Thankfully, we don't have to speculate. Paul tells us in a future letter that he writes to the Corinthian church exactly what the message was that he was preaching when he arrived in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 2, it says, When I came to you, this is Paul speaking, he said, Brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or, or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul preached Christ and him crucified. Paul proclaimed the message that Christ is our substitute. Paul shared with Crispus, his household, and everyone in Corinth who would listen how Christ's atoning work on the cross paid the price for our sins and redeems us from the punishment each one of us so justly deserves. As a result, their lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. People believed and they were saved. If you're sitting here today and you have questions about how this works, come talk to me. Let's have a conversation after service about what it means to follow Christ and let him be your substitute in life. Paul taught the word of God. He preached Christ and him crucified. And through his faithful proclamation of God's word, we see the gospel transform lives, including that of the religious leaders in Corinth. Which leads me to my third observation. The third thing I want us to see this morning is that Paul was faithful to trust God. Look again at verses 9 through 11. Paul was faithful to trust God. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid. But keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you or hurt you, because I have many people in this city. So he stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God. Paul was faithful to trust God. Missionaries work, you heard Pastor, is hard. Missionary work is hard. You heard Pastor Brian this morning talk about how hard it is. The work Paul was doing was difficult. Paul has faced relentless opposition in every town that he's visited. If you're sitting here today and you're under the impression that Paul never got discouraged, that he never got depressed, he never felt defeated, you're greatly mistaken. There were times when Paul struggled. Once again, if we look at his letter to the Corinthian church later on, we see that he admits that he dealt with weakness, he dealt with fear, and much trembling during his time in Corinth. As a result... The Lord appears to him in a night vision to encourage him, to sustain him and strengthen him for the work of ministry. After which point, Paul could have done one of two things. One, he could have ignored God, shrugged off the dream as nothing more than kind of a result of a late night, midnight snack. Or he could choose to trust God, hear what he was saying to him, and be encouraged by it and press on. In the end, we see that Paul trusted God, that he was encouraged by the Lord's word, because verse 11 tells us that Paul stayed in, Corinthia, in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching and preaching the word of God. 
Rather than continue being afraid, Paul trusted God. As followers of Christ, we don't need to fear the world because our king sees us and he cares for us. God loves his people. And as God's people, we can trust in him. By putting his faith and trust in God, Paul was able to stand firm against future opposition. What's the fourth thing I want us to see from our text this morning? Paul was faithful to stand firm. Look again at verses 12 through 17. When Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it'd be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words or names or your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Slosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. Paul was faithful to stand his ground. He was faithful to stand firm against persecution for the sake of the gospel. If you'll notice in verse 14, despite the united attack by the Jews against Paul, he was both willing and he was ready to defend himself and the gospel against his persecutors. But before Paul could even open his mouth, Galileo cut him off and put an end to the matter immediately. I'm not sure which laws Paul was speaking against that the Jews were angry about. Luke doesn't really go into detail about this dispute. But whatever the case was, Galileo was not about to involve himself in this matter. Quite the opposite, in fact. As far as the governor was concerned, it was not the government's job to intervene in these religious issues. For Galileo, Christianity was just another form of Judaism. Therefore, they could settle this matter among themselves. So, Galileo sends the Jews away and dismisses their case against Paul. As you can imagine, the Jews were not very happy about this. And as a result, they decided to take their frustration out on Slosthenes. Not Paul, Slosthenes. Poor guy. Here's where I want us to pause, though. Here's where I'd like us to pause for just a moment. If we were reading through the book of Acts on our own at home, it'd be really easy to blow past verse 17 and continue reading on to the next pericope about Paul's third missionary journey. But if we don't stop to reflect on Slosthenes and the perilous predicament that he's found himself in, I fear that we might be doing ourselves a grave danger. That being said, I want to preface what I'm about to share with the following disclaimer. Scripture is not clear on who Slosthenes here is here in verse 17. Other than Luke stating that he's the leader of the synagogue, we don't know much more about him. But the name Slosthenes is mentioned again in the Bible. In fact, it's our very own gospel crusader Paul who references a man named Slosthenes in his first letter to the Corinthian church later on in his ministry. In Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says this. Paul, called as an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Slosthenes, our brother. Interesting. In which case, the only question we should possibly be asking ourselves in light of all this is how many guys named Slosthenes have you ever met? How many guys named Slosthenes do you know? Not only that, but how many guys named Slosthenes do you think are living in Corinth? It's not like his last name is Smith. Once again, this is completely conjecture. But humor me as we kind of travel down this hypothetical road together. Could it be, could it possibly be in God's grace and sovereignty that the man flogged and beaten by the rioting Jews, the Slosthenes that we read about here in Acts 18, is the same Slosthenes that we read about a handful of pages later in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. The reason I ask, and the reason this question has been keeping me up at night all week, is I just have to know. I just got to know, who is Slosthenes? Because the Slosthenes that we read about here in Acts 18, verse 17, Luke tells us is the leader of the synagogue. So, without getting ahead of me here, if, in God's sovereignty and his grace, the same Slosthenes that is the leader of the Jewish synagogue here in Acts is the same Slosthenes who is the brother of Christ in 1 Corinthians 1, 
That can only mean one thing, and one thing only. Slosthenes got saved. Slosthenes got saved. I'm worried that you're not really tracking with me here, so let me explain this a little clearer. Paul arrives in Corinth, where Crispus serves as the Jewish leader of the synagogue. The Jews are blaspheming and resisting the gospel message that Paul's proclaiming. So Paul says, forget you guys. I'm only going to share the gospel with the Gentiles from here on out. After that, he meets up with a worshiper of God named Justice, who just so happens lives next door to the synagogue. Weird, right? Then, as Paul and his buddy Justice are proclaiming the gospel at their house church next door to the Jewish synagogue, it just so happens that Crispus, the leader of the Jews, gets saved. Sorry. What I meant was not only does Crispus get saved, but his entire household gets saved as well. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. That isn't right. What I'm trying to say is Paul and Justice, they have this church plan, right? It's meeting in their house, which is next door to the Jewish synagogue. And while they're preaching the gospel there, Crispus, along with his entire household, gets saved. And many Corinthians hear the gospel, and they get saved as well. But it doesn't end there. Because later on, the Jews get together and they plan this massive attack against Paul, which unfortunately for them does not go their way. So, as a result, rather than beat Paul up, drag him out of town, these people take their frustration out on Crispus's replacement, the current leader of the synagogue, a man named Slosthenes, which means absolutely nothing unless, unless you consider the possibility that the Christian man named Slosthenes that Paul refers to in his letter to the Corinthian church is the Jewish man named Slosthenes here in Acts 18, 17, in which case it can only mean one thing. Slosthenes got saved. Either he got saved before he was saved and uh, seized and beaten in front of the tribunal, or he got saved after he was seized and beaten in front of the tribunal. Either way, the Holy Spirit got a hold of him, and the Lord rescued him out of darkness and brought him into the marvelous light, which means that Sosthenes heard the gospel, accepted it, and believed. Which, for better or worse, just leads me to speculate that Sosthenes probably got saved before he was beaten by the Jews, which would explain why they chose to take their frustrations out on him rather than Paul in the first place. Sosthenes was probably already leaning towards Christianity, which is why the Jews gathered together to formulate this united attack against Paul. They had already lost one leader to the gospel. They weren't about to lose a second one. They needed to put an end to this nonsense before it turned their whole town upside down. I've said it before and I'll say it again. God's got the whole thing rigged. God's got the whole thing rigged. He's got the whole thing rigged for our good and for his glory. Paul was faithful to proclaim the gospel in Corinth. And as a result, lives were transformed. People were saved, including the religious leaders in town. The next and final thing I want us to see today is that Paul was faithful to stay the course. Paul was faithful to stay the course. If we just tiptoe a little bit through the opening verse of next week's text, we'll clearly see that Paul was faithful to persevere and remain committed to the gospel. In Acts 18, verse 18, it says, After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria. Paul was faithful to stay the course. Paul remained in Corinth for some time, despite the persecution, despite the organized attack by the Jews, and despite all the headaches and difficulties surrounding Paul. He was faithful to stay the course and continue proclaiming the gospel in Corinth. Earlier in verse 11, Luke tells us that Paul was in Corinth for at least 18 months. I'm not sure exactly how much time in total Paul spent ministering here in Corinth, but we know that he stayed long enough to encourage the saints and to strengthen them in the word of God. This is quite the shift for Paul. This is quite the shift from his typical response. If you remember from our previous chapters of Acts, in the past few towns that we've seen Paul visit, when there's persecution and the townspeople threaten to stone him, or actually do in fact stone him and drive him out of town, Paul shows no hesitation about getting back up and moving on to the next stop on his missionary journey. But here in Corinth, however, we see a different decision on Paul's part. Rather than leave when the going gets tough, Paul makes the decision to stay, and continue sharing the gospel until the Lord directs him to move on. 
This serves as a subtle yet a great reminder that God in his sovereignty may give us longer seasons in some places than in others. Wherever we are and however long we're there, I want to encourage you to remain faithful, to share God's word, and to make disciples by pointing others to Christ and proclaiming the gospel in the times and the places where God has positioned you. This morning we've seen all the various ways that Paul was faithful. He was faithful to do the work necessary to continue proclaiming the gospel. He was faithful to preach the word and proclaim the gospel both to Jews and to the Gentiles. We saw that Paul was faithful to trust God and how he was faithful to stand firm, even when there were massive attacks brought against him. In the end, we saw how throughout all of this, Paul was faithful to stay the course and to remain in Corinth longer than he did anywhere else on his missionary journey until the Lord released him and directed him to move on to the next town. After looking at Paul's incredible examples of faithfulness and his trust in the Lord, it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and challenge us all to be faithful, just as Paul was faithful. In fact, I could probably come up with some really catchy, sticky statements like, don't let your faithfulness falter, or don't peer out and deny Christ, but persist like Paul and persevere until the end. And as great as that all would be, and as easy and as an application point as being faithful would be, I'm afraid that in the end, it would not bring honor to God's word or to the main point that Luke is intending here for his readers. Or don't get me wrong, we should be faithful. As Christians, we must be faithful to do the work of an evangelist, to preach the word, to trust God, to stand firm, and to stay the course. But many, if not all of us in the room today, already know that. So I don't want to just tack on an application to my message this morning. Especially because I believe Luke, and in turn God, would have us see something so much greater than that today. The main point that I want you to take away from our time in God's Word together this morning isn't that we should be faithful like Paul was faithful, but rather that God strengthened Paul for the work of ministry. God sustained Paul for the work of ministry. I believe that's the main point that Luke is trying to convey here. And I believe that's the main point that God would have us share, have me share with you from his word this morning as well. The Lord strengthened Paul and he equipped Paul for the work of ministry. I don't know if you underline or if you highlight in your Bible, but if you do, I'd encourage you to highlight these verses, verses 9, 10, and 11. Because apparently at some point I highlighted these verses in my Bible months ago. At some point I highlighted these verses during one of my devotional times, and I'm glad that I did. Because in preparing this message, these three verses I saw actually act as a hinge. They act as connecting tissue to our entire story today. Everything that Paul was able to accomplish while he was in Corinth, all of his faithfulness during his time here, is centered around, or is a direct result, of what the Lord said to Paul here in verses 9, 10, and 11. If we look at those one more time, we see the Lord speaking to Paul in a night vision. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you. No one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. So he stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one will hurt you. God strengthened and encouraged Paul for the work of ministry. As I mentioned earlier, Paul boldly admits that when he came to Corinth, he did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom, but that he came to them in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Weakness, fear, trembling. How in the world could Paul possibly have been faithful to do all the things that we've just seen him accomplish if he was full of weakness and fear and trembling? Simple, really. God encouraged Paul. God prepared Paul for the struggles that were ahead of him. How did he do that? He appeared to Paul in a night vision and said, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I am with you. No one will hurt you. I can kind of picture how this conversation between God and Paul went in his dream. 
I can picture Paul saying, but Lord, I don't have brilliance of speech or wisdom. I can just see God replying, shh, don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent. I'm with you. No one will hurt you. Paul was able to be faithful because God strengthened and encouraged him. Church, maybe you're sitting here today, and the very thought of telling you, your coworkers about Jesus on Monday terrifies you. Maybe you're sitting here today, and the thought of sharing the gospel with a neighbor or even a stranger is frightening to you. The good news is you're not alone. Chances are many of us in the room, when faced with the thought of proclaiming the gospel, find ourselves filled with feelings of weakness, of fear, of trembling. In which case, if we were to take a deep breath and listen closely, I believe we would hear the Holy Spirit's voice whisper in our ear, don't be afraid, keep speaking, don't be silent, because I am with you. Or maybe you're sitting here today and you're facing challenges greater than you ever imagined. Maybe you're in a season right now where you feel like you are literally walking through the valley of the shadow of death and you don't know what to do. If that's you, then maybe what you need to do is close your eyes, let go of your fears, put your trust in God because God's word tells us that we don't need to fear because he is with us. Church, Paul was faithful because God strengthened him to do the work that he had been called to do. In the same way, we too can be faithful to do the work that God is calling us to do because the Lord will strengthen us. He will sustain us and he will equip us for what is ahead of us, just like he did Paul. All we have to do is not be afraid, put our trust in God, and continue moving forward because God is with us. He is faithful God is faithful to equip us and strengthen us for the work he's prepared for us to do. All we have to do is simply put our hope in him. Paul was faithful because he is faithful. And because God is faithful, we too can be faithful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the example that we saw in Paul's life today. Lord, I, I thank you that Paul's faithfulness was not because of his own work or his own efforts, but Lord, because of the work that you're doing inside of Paul's life. Lord, that you sustained him for ministry, that you strengthened him. Lord, that you encouraged him to keep pressing forward even when times got hard. Lord, today I, I pray for our church. I pray for us this morning. I lift us to you today. I pray that you would strengthen us, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just guide us and lead us and comfort us. Lord, whenever we get nervous or afraid to, to proclaim the gospel and, and, and share the saving message of Jesus Christ, Lord, when the chatterbox rages in our head, I pray that we would just silence it with your voice telling us, don't be silent, keep speaking, I am with you. Dear Lord, I pray for those in our faith family who are struggling, who are hurting, or maybe dealing with sickness or illness, or, or just obstacles in their life that feel like they're impossible to overcome. Lord, I pray that in these seasons of difficulty, you would encourage them, strengthen them, let them know that you are with them. I thank you that your word says you never leave us, you never forsake us, you never abandon us. Help us to put our trust, our hope, not in the things of this world, Lord, but in you and you alone. Help us to walk with you, to trust in you, and to believe in you. In your holy and precious name, Lord, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Josiah. Church, we have a, a good God. Amen. He's such a good, he's such a faithful God. Right now, we're going to go ahead and uh, switch over to our response to the sermon. So we'll go ahead and have our ushers come forward, and we're getting ready to partake in our uh, communion here. If you are here today and you are a Christian, we encourage you to please go ahead and take in communion with us. Take the, take the juice, take the cracker. But I want to I wanna share that if you're not a believer today, that 
you not partake. And the reason being is like, this is a wonderful opportunity for the Christian to remember what Christ has done for us. And if uh, you, you can't say that you believe that Christ has come to this earth, that he's died on the cross for your sins, that he's risen from the grave and that he has defeated death, hell, and the grave, then we would just encourage you not to partake in this. But, but throughout the sermon, if God was tugging on your heart, the Holy Spirit was working in you, and you're, you're, you're just saying, man, I, I want to become a believer today. I want to trust in this Lord. Thank you. Man, what a wonderful opportunity and what a wonderful way to respond to the sermon than by taking in and declaring that, okay, Christ has died for me. His body was given for me. His blood was shed for me. And so Christians, non-Christians alike, I just want to encourage you in here, in this room, just take a moment to just think on the Lord, think on the sermon, think on the faithfulness of God and how faithful, how wonderful he truly is. encouraging about this is that even in our unfaithfulness, God is still so faithful. He's still so good to us. So good that even though it's been said throughout the sermon, and I've already said hey, just a few moments ago, but that he's so faithful that he would send Jesus to this earth to take your sin on himself, to die on the cross for your sins. What a faithful God that we have and how good he is. here did everyone everybody taken care of up here out there great thank you gentlemen Father, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to partake in the Lord's Supper. Thank you for your blood that was shed for us. Thank you for your body that was given for us. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. How wonderful you are. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you to go ahead and separate the two cups here. We got the, the cracker and the juice. We're going to go ahead and take the, the cracker, and this symbolizes the body that was Christ's body that was given for us. Let's go ahead and take that. And in the like manner, let's go ahead and take the juice as well, which represents Christ's blood that was shed for us on the cross. Father, again, we thank you so much. For this opportunity, Lord. God, we we just thank you. And Lord, we ask that you would just get all the glory through our lives and help us to constantly remember you and what you've done for us, Lord. We love you and we just give you all the praise, glory, and honor. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I'd like to invite you to stand. We're going to sing a final song and uh, we're going to have some folks coming through collecting some of these cups here. So just be on the lookout for them. They'll take these cups from you.
say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. An army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Singing our call to war. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the price for which he died, an inheritance of nations. the cross where love and mercy meet as the son of god is stricken then see his foes like crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and christ emerges from the grave this victory march Continues till the day every eye and heart shall see him. So spirit come, so spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with christ we stand in glory when faced with trials when faced with trials on every side we know the outcome is secure and christ will have the price for which he died an inheritance of nations conclude with the benediction from Jude. It's going to be Jude 1, which there's only one chapter there, but Jude verses 24 and 25, which say, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. This is God's word. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Have a great week.
still my soul The Lord is on your side Bear patiently The cross of grief or pain Leave to your God To order and provide In every change Still my soul, your best, your heavenly friend Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end Be still my soul, your God will undertake To guide the future as he has the past your, your confidence Let nothing shake All now mysterious Shall be bright at last Be still my soul The waves and winds still know His voice who Still my soul When dearest friends depart And all is dark And in the veil of tears Then shall you better know His love, His heart 